Hello class, in this video, we're going to cover the example problems from section 4.2, estimation, graphs, and mathematical models. And there are 15 problems in this section in your MyLabs assignment, okay? So the first few problems are mostly rounding. So it says round to the nearest given place and it has 1.83343. Now you do need to know your place value in order for you to be able to do the problem. So I'm going to map out the place values real quick in case someone does not know their place values. So when you have a decimal number, it creates each digit has a certain value. And we don't usually go beyond five, one, two, three, four, five. You may have more on this side, you know, of course, but with the decimals, we don't usually go too far beyond five. So basically the way it works is in front of the decimal, this one we know, right? If I have a one here, that means I have $1, right? One. So these are the ones place. Then next, if I have one, one, that's 11 bucks. That's $10 plus one, which is 11. So these are tens. Then if I had one zero zero, that means I would have a hundred. So these are the hundreds. These are the thousands. These are the ten thousands. These are the hundred thousands. And if I had more digits, it would just keep going. It would be after thousands is millions. So millions, 10 millions, 100 millions. That would be the next three digits. Then billions, billions, 10 billions, 100 billions. That would be the next digit, next three digits. Then trillions, right? So trillions, 10 trillions, 100 trillions. That would be the next three digits. It just keeps with that pattern. Going in the opposite direction, uh, past the decimal, there's only one ones. That's the main thing to remember, okay? So if you're gonna say the word ones, there should only be one ones in the whole sequence. So after the decimal, there's no once, okay? This just doesn't make any sense. If you have something over one, three over one, it's just the whole number, three, and that's a ones place number. But if you have three over 10, that creates the decimal of 0.3, okay? So these are called, tenths and the th is because the denominator the 10 is in the denominator so if i have hundreds that's going to give me the second digit um then we have thousands with the th and then ten thousands and then hundred thousands Okay, and so it keeps continuing in this manner. So for this particular problem, it says round to the nearest given place, and the nearest given place they gave them was thousands. So if you notice, thousands is the third digit to the right of the decimal. So here's my decimal. What I did was I marked where the third digit was because that's the place value that I'm supposed to be rounding to. And then what I always do is I always look, well, you have to, you have to look to the right of that underlying number to decide whether or not that that number is going to change the underlined number or not. If this number behind the place value that you indicated, if this number is a five, six, seven, eight, or nine, so five or more, it will cause this number to go up one, okay? If this is not five or more, if it's four, three, two, one, or zero, then it will not change that number. And so in this case, because it was a four, it did not change this number. So this number stayed a three and everything before it will stay untouched. So notice that it is still 1.833. Everything after the underlying number will just cut off, okay? So when I'm doing this, and they actually become zeros, but zeros at the end of a decimal never need to be written down. So that's why they just disappear. Now round the number to the nearest hundred thousands. 
So here's tenths, hundreds, thousands. Ten thousands, hundred thousands. So tenths, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands. So I underlined this guy and I looked at the next one. That three is not enough to change the six to a seven. So from the, lot, the underlined number and on to the left, all of those digits stay exactly the same. Everything after the decimal value six is going to disappear. Now, number three says, obtain an estimate for the following computation by rounding the numbers so that the resulting arithmetic can easily be performed by hand or in your head. Then use a calculation or a calculator, I'm sorry, to perform the computation. How reasonable is your estimate when compared to the actual answer? So here's the problem, 338 plus 568. And what it asked us to do is round the two numbers to the nearest 10th, not 10th with the TH, just 10, like is in tens place. An estimate of the sum is, so the tens place is this one. If there's no decimal, the decimal is after the last number. If there's no decimal, the decimal is after the last number. So then that makes this the ones and this the tenths. This is the ones, this is the tenths. This eight will cause this three to go up, so it will become 34, and everything after the bar will become a zero. Now remember, all the zeros after the decimal can be dropped. It's the zero before the decimal that must stay, okay? Same thing here, this six, this eight will cause that six to turn to a seven. So that number, instead of being 56, turns into 57. And then this, zero, this number and everything else after it will turn to zeros. So that will become a zero before the decimal. All the zeros behind the decimal can be dropped. Just like when these all turn to zeros, those zeros were behind the decimal. And so those zeros were just dropped. Now, 340 plus 570 is 910. So that was my estimate was 910. Then the actual sum, um, I wrote it here, but you could do it in the calculator. Um, 338 plus 568 was 906. So the actual result was 906. And it says, how reasonable is your estimate when compared to the actual answer? Ours was reasonable, and the estimate seems to be a bit higher compared to the actual number. See, my estimate is a little bit higher than the actual um, answer. Now for number four, Let me give it some time to focus because that is not, there we go. So for number four, it's the same direction. So we're going to estimate and then we're going to um, figure out whether or not that's reasonable. So the estimate, I, I rounded them to whole numbers just to prevent all the decimal computations. So here's my decimal. I went to the first non the, the first digit before the decimal. This three was not enough to change it, so it changed to 26. These guys would become zeros, but zeros after the dot, you never have to write them. Same thing here. The two is not going to change this 10, so it stays 10. These all turn to zero, but any zeros after the dot do not need to be written. And then if I, if I take the difference, 26 minus 10 is actually 16. So this is my estimate, 16. And the, the instruction said, type in a whole number. So when I saw that they said, type in a whole number, that was my clue to round to the nearest whole number. And so that's why I, I got rid of the decimals, okay? Um, the actual difference is, 26.31 minus 10.232 was 16.078. And those are pretty close. So it says the estimate is reasonable, but this estimate is a little bit lower, a little bit smaller than this. Okay, this has just a tiny smidget more than that does. So my estimate is a little bit lower than the actual answer. Now, number five, 
um, same directions here. So it had 0 0.88 times 412. Um, they did not tell me how to write in my answer. So there was no hint as to how I should round. They didn't tell me specifically to round to a certain place value. So what you do when, when you're trying to estimate, but they don't give you any context clues on how to, to round it before you, before you get the estimate, um, you're supposed to use the first non-zero number as your place value. So notice that my first non-zero number is this one, and my first non-zero number here is this one. So I underlined both of those first non-zero numbers. Then this eight does cause that to go up to a nine, but then this eight would turn to a zero, but any zeros after the dot, you don't need to write. So I wrote zero dot, this change to a nine, and then nothing else. For the 412, remember the dot is here. So the one is not gonna change this four, so it stays a four. The one and the two are gonna become zeros and everything else after that are zeros, but I don't need to write all the zeros to the right of this decimal, okay? So I ended up with 0 0.9 times 400, which calculated to 360. 0 0.9 times 400 was 360. Now the actual or exact value was 0 0.88 times 412. And that was 362.56. So these values are approximately equal. Notice that if I were to round this to the tenths place like that number, it does come out to be the exact same thing. So those are approximately equivalent. Now, number six says, determine, excuse me, determine the following estimate without using a calculator, then use a calculator to perform the computation necessary to obtain an exact answer. How reasonable is your estimate when compared to the actual answer? It says you lease a car at 603 per month for five years. Estimate the total cost of the lease by rounding the monthly payment to the nearest hundred. So my monthly payment was $603 per month. So I rounded that to the nearest hundred, which would mean I underlined this one. This is not enough to change it. So it's six and then zero, zero. Remember when there's no decimal, it's here and I don't need to write all the zeros past the decimal, okay? So if I take that 600 and I multiply it by five years and I multiply that by 12 months per year, um, the months will cancel and the years will cancel. And so all I'll be left with is dollars. So 600, 600 times five times 12 makes 36,000. Now the actual cost would be to take the original monthly payment multiply it by the number of years I've got a lease, and then multiply it by the number of months per each year, right? You don't make five payments in the whole five years because um, you have to pay each month. So multiply it by the number of months per year, then multiply it by the five years, and you do end up with 36,180. And it says the estimate is a little lower than the actual results. What is the difference? Just subtract the two values you got, your estimate and your actual and you will get that difference of 180. So this 180 is what they were looking for in that box, okay? Now, number seven, same directions as number six. So we're gonna do all the computation, we're gonna do our estimate first, then do the actual and then compare. So if a person who works 40 hours per week earns 49, um, $49,300 per year, Estimate that person's hourly wage by rounding the annual income to the nearest 10,000. So this is ones, tens, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands. Now this will make this go up to a five and all of these numbers before the decimal will turn to zero. So it becomes 50,000. So five, zero, 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 zero. Um, use the estimate that are 50 weeks in a year. So I took $50,000 per year um, and I'm dividing that by the 50 weeks per year. And then I'm dividing that by the 40 hours it takes me to work per year, okay? 
And what's going to happen is that the years are going to cancel and the weeks are going to cancel. And so what I would be left with is money per hour. So 50,000, one, two, three, four, divided by 50 weeks, divided by 40, gives me $25 per hour. Now it says use 52 weeks a year to find the actual hour, uh, hourly wage. So I took the original 49,300, divided that by the 52 weeks per year, divided that by 40 hours per week. So we have 49300 divided by 52, divided by 40, and we end up with 23.7019, so on and so forth. Um, it doesn't need ask us, um, we are talking about money, and money never goes beyond cents, right? And cents are only two decimal places. So what I would do is I would look at this decimal to this number to see if it's gonna make that go up, and it does not. So it essentially rounds to $23.70 per hour. Now the estimate, look at my estimate and look at this one. My estimate is a little higher than the actual results. And the difference is take your estimate minus what you got and the difference is $1.30. Now number eight says 10 people ordered calculators. The least expensive was $39.95 and the most expensive was $99.95. Half of them ordered a $79.95 calculator. Select the best estimate of the amount spent on 10 calculators. So 10 people ordered calculators. Half of them ordered the $79.99 one. And if you look at these two, about somewhere in the middle there would be the 79, right? Let me see, 99.95 minus 39.95. And then half of the way there would be 30 units. So 39.95 plus 30 um, would be about 69.95. So in between here is about 69.95. So I'm just gonna go with the 79.95. That's a pretty good estimate. Um, we know that half of them are gonna get this. So if I round that to the first place value, because it doesn't tell me what to round to, uh, this nine will change that to an eight. This will become a zero and so will these, but I don't need to write the ones after the dot. Now, since there's about 10 people getting, or there is 10 people getting these, um, we would multiply that and I would get 800. And then all you're doing is looking at the options that they have and picking the one that is closest to your estimate. And the one that is closest to my estimate out of all the values that were options was 760. Now, number nine says traveling at an average rate between 40 and 70 miles per hour for six to nine hours, select the best estimate for the distance traveled. So in this case, um, oh, I'm just looking at the next problem, I'm sorry. <laughs> My brain went over here. Um, so about halfway between the 40 and the 70, is 55 okay and if you're not sure how to figure that out what you do is you do 40 plus 70 and you divide it by two and that will give you what is happening in halfway okay so halfway between 40 and 70 is 55 then halfway between six and nine six plus nine divided by two is three is 7.5 so in the middle there is 555, and in the middle here is 7.5. And so what I've done is I've taken 55 times 7.5, and I've received this answer. Now, out of all of the choices, the closest one was 440, okay? Another way you could have done it is with a range. So you could have taken the lowest speed and the lowest number of hours and multiplied those together and then taken the highest speed times the largest amount of hours, and you got this. And then essentially you wanna make sure you pick a value that's between those two numbers, because anything lower than 240 is simply impossible. 
And anything more than 630 is also impossible, okay? Um, and if you wanted, you could even do the little average in there, 240 plus 630 divided by two is 435. And so you definitely wanna pick something close to that midway point, okay? And 440 is definitely really close to 435. So there's a couple of ways you could have done it, okay? You could have taken the midpoints of each one and then did the multiplication or done the multiplication of the lower, lower ends and the higher ends and then took the midpoint, okay? Either way, they both, they both work. I don't know what's going on. My phone is just beeping and beeping and beeping over here with like seven messages. So don't, oh my goodness. A lot of people are needing help at this hour. Um, turn that off. Okay, good. Okay, so number 10 now, the one that I was looking at, says, imagine that Amy counted 60 members or 60 numbers for, um, I cannot, oh, there it goes. 60 numbers per minute. Oh. Got it. She was counting and she counted 60 numbers per minute and continued to count nonstop until she reached 11,000. Determine a reasonable estimate of the number of hours it would take Amy to complete the counting. So the estimate is, is she did about 60 numbers per minute. And if I multiply 60 minutes per hour, um, Actually, I shouldn't be multiplying. Yeah, I should. Because if she's doing 60 per minute, then um, then I would multiply by 60 to figure out how many she's doing per hour. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so then I have 60 times from each minute times 60 minutes in an hour. That gave me an estimate of 360 numbers per hour. Then, um, and the reason why it makes sense is because instead of writing per minute like that, I can write per minute like this. And then this minute in the numerator would cancel with these minutes in the denominator, which leaves me with the 60 numbers per hour or whatever that value, numbers per hour, numbers per hour. Now, 11,000 is approximately 10,000, okay? And 3,600 is approximately 4,000. If I take my approximation for the total number of numbers and I divide it by her rate, you know, that's how many numbers she counts in an hour. It's about 2.5 hours. Now, if it's asking for a whole number, then I round it to the nearest whole number and that five does make it go up to three. So three is the um, estimated value. Um, you could have also just found the exact value or actual um, value. And that would have been the 11,000 that she started with divided by this rate here, 3,600 numbers per hour, which means it was going to take Oops, 11, one, two, three, divided by 3,600, 3.055, so on and so forth. But if I round this to the nearest whole number, it's still the same value, three, okay? But it did say for me to use estimate, which is why we're doing all of that rounding. So this problem gets its own page. It was, it had colors, but I didn't have colors. So I just did patterns. Um, the circle graph shows the most important problems for the 19,182,714 high school teenagers in a country. Without using a calculator, estimate the number of high school teenagers for whom doing well in school is the most important problem. So here's the, the key. Um, the darkest shaded region is get... Uh, people that identified the biggest problem or most important problem is getting along with your parents. And that was only 2% of the population. The next is going to be these stripes here. 
And that was the group that said um, that their biggest problem was getting into college, which was 4%. Then the next group is got these little curved lines. So we've got the curves there and those had sexual issues, 3%. That was their big, their important problem. Um, the next one is the lightly shaded, which crime and violence in school was the large, the biggest problem, 8% of the population. Um, doing well in school is the polka dots here. And that was at 11% of the population. Um, the squiggles uh, is the social pressures and fitting in. That was the biggest problem. Um, the swirly one, I hope that's funny. I put the swirly one for drugs. I mean, they make you loopy, right? <laughs> um, but that's funny. So that one's 22% of the population thought that drugs were the biggest problem. And then this other region, which is just blank, um, that is others. So there might have been other problems that were indicated, but these were the most that were largely selected. So those had their own titles. Everything else just got grouped into one giant pie slice. Okay, um, so the question is, doing well in school is the most important problem for approximately how many of the high school teenagers? So I know that there's a precisely this many of high school teachers that were surveyed here, but I don't wanna use this precise number. I wanted to use an approximation. So what I did was I went to this first digit and then I rounded it. So that turned into 20 million instead of 19 million, so on and so forth. And then I multiplied that by the rate of the um, doing well in school. So the doing well in school was 11%, so I did 11%. Um, and then I did 20 million times, and 11% is the same as 0 0.11. You can do that in here, you can do 11%. And if you hit enter, it tells you it's 0 0.11. And so then I did 20, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 times 0 0.11. And I got this value. And according to the options that they gave me, the closest one that was closest one to this value was the option 1900. Now I noticed that I didn't round this value, okay? Um, and I rounded this one to the first decimal. If I would have rounded this one to the second decimal, then I would have had to have, this one would have not changed that. And so it just would have been 19 million. And then if I would have multiplied by, and I rounded this one, so here's the decimal here. If I round that one, it would be 0 0.10. And if I multiply those numbers, I do get, one nine zero 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 zero. Um, but that's only if I took those specific um, approximations. So it didn't tell me how to specifically take those approximations. So I just had to guess. And normally when I do that, I just do the first digit, the first non-zero digit. But I really wasn't consistent with myself in this problem because if that was the case, then I should have done 11% is the same as 0 0.11, but I should have also rounded to the nearest um, non -zero, first non-zero number, which would have meant 0 0.1, because then that guy would have turned to a zero and I don't have to write that zero. And so right here, what I really should have done is 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and then I would have gotten just 2 million. And between all the options there, the closest one to 2 million was still the 1,900,000. So it still fits. I just didn't do it consistently like I should have in when there's no explanation on what to round to or what to estimate to, you just go with the first non-zero number. So this is not a zero. So that's why I rounded to this place value. However, with the 11%, what's in, so it was in its decimal form. The first non-zero number is this one on the left. And that one was not enough to make it go up. So it did stay 0 0.1. Um, let's keep going. Okay, number 12 says on, or 
an online test of English spelling looked at how well people spell difficult words. The bar graph shows how many people per 100 spelled each word correctly. A, estimate the number of people per 100 who spelled weird correctly, round to the nearest five, and then B, in a group consisting of 88,723 8, randomly selected people, estimate how many people how many more people can correctly spell weird than inoculate. So this is the bar graph that they gave me. These are the most uh, the words that they're talking about people spelling correctly. Um, and then these are the number of people per 100. So essentially, there's the percentage. 20% of people spell each of these correctly, 40% each of these, and so forth. So for part A, if I look at the word weird, it does seem to be falling just over the 70 mark. Um, it may not look like it here on mine, but when I had... Uh, I think I had a ruler. So it looked like this to me when I was on there. So halfway is 70. And so if I'm between 70 and 80, my guess was it was about 75. Okay. And I know I'm drawing on my paper and I don't draw straight. Um, it's easier to see in my math labs where the graph is all nice and precise and all that good stuff. Um, so it was about 75 per 100 that got it correct. Okay. Um, and so that's all we needed to indicate was just basically what the bar graph showed me, okay? Now, if I look at both words, weird and inoculate, so that I can do part B, inoculate was in here in the middle. So to me, that halfway is 30, and between 30 and 40, I'm going to guess it's about 35, okay? So if I take the difference, that means it's about 40 people per 100. That distance is about 40 people per 100. Um, and so what I did was, is I rounded this again, it doesn't tell me what to round to. So I rounded to the first digit and I got about 9,000 people. So, I mean, I'm talking about 9,000 people and about 40 people per 100 are going to spell it correctly. So then that means that 9,000 times 40 was 360000, but I still have to divide by 100. So essentially two zeros get wiped out and I end up with 3,600. So about 3,600 more people can spell the word weird correctly than the word inoculate out of these 9,000 people, okay? So number 13, I realized with all the colors, I had to go grab my color pins. So I grabbed blue and red for this one. Um, Number 13 says, with aging, body fat increases and muscle mass uh, declines. The line graph show the percent body fat in adult women and men as they age from 25 to 75 years. So it says, find an estimate for the percent body fat in a 75-year-old woman. So here I am at 75. And if I go to look at where that's at, that looks like it's somewhere in between here. So this is 40, which means between 36 and 40, halfway would be 38. And I'm about in the middle of that. So I would say that that was 37 and 38. So about 37%. Now part B says, at what age does the percent body fat in women reach a maximum? Well, this is the percent in body fat. So that height right, peak right there would be that maximum. And what year does that fall on? It falls on the 55, okay? So when people are about 55 years, when women are about 55 years old, that's when you reach that maximum body fat. Um, so then it says, what is the percent body fat for that age? Well, at 55, it's exactly 40%, okay? Then part C says, at what age do women have 34% body fat? So here's 32, 33, 34. So that would be this here. 
And the only time that the, whim, the women bar graph touches that value is there, which would be at 25. And so it would be when the women are 25 years old. And it should be going through the other one too, but I can't draw right. I never can. Always comes out all messed up, but. But you get the idea. Okay, moving on to number 14. I will have to scoot that up just a little bit. So it says the bar graph gives the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide. It says, A, the yearly increase in the average atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide is approximately how many um, parts per million per year? So the yearly increase. So what we did was, is we compared the beginning data to the ending data. And so we took the larger number minus the smaller number, and then the year minus this year, okay? And the reason why I did the years at the bottom is because it used the language per year. When it says per year, that means that the years have to go below the fraction bar, okay? Um, and the PPM needs to go above. So PPM per year means PPM over the years. So that's why I took the PPMs on the top and the years at the bottom. And you have to be consistent, like these two values have to go together. So the 402 does come from the year 2015. The value 309 does come from the year 1950. When I find that differences, I get 93 over 65. And when I divide that in my calculator, I got this decimal and I rounded this decimal to the nearest um, tenth because I noticed in the problem, it did say to enter an, a number rounded to the nearest tenth. Now for part B, it says a mathematical model estimates the average atmospheric concentrate of carbon dioxide, C, in parts per million times years after 1950 is this. So this 1.4 is the rate um, that the, that it's changing per year. And I just determined that rate. So there's the rate that it's changing per year times X, which is the number of years after 1950. And then this is the value when X is equal to zero. So when we're talking about 1950, we're starting at 309. So notice that it starts here and then the graph follows the line, okay? And so essentially what we're doing is we're giving it that starting position and then we're doing it by the rate. So this is how you will calculate it. You will take the rate that you found from part A and plug it in here. And you will take that first value from the chart and plug it in here, okay? And that will give you the, um, the formula that they're asking you for. Now it says the model from part B proceeds, predicts the average atmospheric con uh, concentrate of carbon dioxide will be how much ppm in 2050? Well, 2050 is 100 years after 1950. So that means that the x value is going to be 100. And if I plug in 100 into that formula, 1.4 times 100 plus 309 is actually 449. And so that is the predicted value for 2050 further down the line. Now the very last problem is very similar to that previous one. It says the bar graph gives the average global temperature for eight selected years. And so here's the degrees in Fahrenheit for the average global temperature. And then there's the years and they even give you the specific values above the bars. So it says the yearly increase in the average global temperature is approximately how many degrees Fahrenheit per year? Again, there it tells me degrees per year. So degrees on top, the year at the bottom. Whatever follows the word per goes at the bottom. So then I'm take the first, the, the biggest one, and then the smallest one. So the biggest one minus the smallest one, the biggest year minus the lowest year. So that gives me 1.33 over 65, which in my calculator 
1.33 divided by 65 was this decimal and I rounded it to two places because that's the first non-zero number. So that zero is not gonna change it. So it's just 0 0.02. And I think it might even tell you to round it to two decimal places in the um, instructions. So for part B, it says a mathematical model that estimates the average global temperature T in degrees Fahrenheit X years after 1950 is T equals what? And they want us to come up with that mathematical model. So remember, you're always gonna put your rate, your rate you found from part A. So that value times X plus what happens at the very beginning. And so what happens at the very beginning? It's 56.95, okay? Um, and so that's the number that goes there. And that is the model that you'll type into that box. So this is what they want here in this line. Then part C says the model from part B predicts the average global temperature will be how many degrees Fahrenheit in 2030? Well, 2030 is actually 80 years after 1950. And if you don't know that, you can just subtract, right? It would take me 50 years to get into the 2000s and then another 30 years to get to 2030. So that's 80 years total that have passed. So that means that my X value is 80. So all I need to do is plug in 80 into that formula and you end up with what? 0 0.02 times 80 plus 56.95. And I get exactly the value 58.55. And that is the end of this particular section. And I will see you guys in the next video.